Hey, my name is Nick Kuntz. I'm a neuroradiologist and head of neck imager at Indiana University School of Medicine. And I thought I would try to put together uh, a collection of, of some longer uh, lectures that, that would appeal to radiology residents and, and maybe neuroradiology fellows and, and even practicing uh, radiologists and neuroradiologists out there. This is sort of in addition to the IU Case of the Day series that I've been doing for a while. Um, so at any rate, uh, welcome to the, the first of these. It's going to be on the topic of conductive hearing loss. A little backstory on this. I was asked by Lubda Shaw, my, my good friend, my mentor at the University of Utah, if I would put this talk together for the ARRS meeting this year. And, and unfortunately, and, and understandably so, because of the, the issues that we're struggling with with, uh, with COVID and trying to contain it uh, as best we can, the, the meeting was canceled. And so I, I thought this would be a good opportunity to put some of those words down and, and at least share with, with trainees and, and really anybody out there who wants to listen and, and learn a little bit more about conductive hearing loss. So I have no disclosures to make, kind of weird uh, saying that as I'm talking to nobody in an audience uh, at the moment, but I, I wish I had some disclosures. Uh, but again, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Lou Bishaw. She's been a great friend and mentor over the years to me. Um, I'd also like to thank Rick Wiggins, uh, who I could say the same about, good friend, great mentor, um, uh, really has taught me pretty much everything I know about head and neck imaging uh, from the University of Utah as well. And Rick Harnsberger, uh, again, much the same uh, admiration for him as a, as a radiologist and, and an educator and friend. So um, I would like to thank the two Ricks, though, who over the years were kind enough to share a lot of knowledge with me. And, and importantly for this, were uh, over the years have shared images and, and cool cases and, and some graphics that I'm using in this presentation. So thanks to, to all three of them. So I'll start by saying that hearing loss is, it's common. It's very common, in fact. It's thought that maybe somewhere on the order of 40 or 50 million Americans suffer from it. Um, and as you get older, the, the risk increases. So one in three of, uh, out of patients over the age of 65 has hearing loss. That increases to two out of three for patients over the age of 75. And yet even in younger and middle-aged adults, it's still a problem. About 15% of the time, uh, patients will have hearing loss. It's estimated that about 15% of children in the United States have some degree of hearing loss. Um, and that uh, uh, means that about two or three out of a thousand newborns, uh, importantly, have some hearing loss congenitally. So in addition to the children who acquire hearing loss, um, uh, you know, a small number, but an important subset of children will be born with congenital hearing loss as well. And so hearing loss can be conductive. It can be sensory neural. It can even be mixed in terms of its etiology. We're going to focus just on conductive hearing loss. So conductive hearing loss is... So how do we image conductive hearing loss? Really, uh, high-resolution CT is our uh, mainstay of imaging. You can do this with very thin slices, maybe between 0.4 and 0.7 millimeter slice thickness. And it's critical to use the multiplanar reconstructions. I'll show you cases uh, where that's really important. MRI does have a role, an important role, but it's a limited role. It's very valuable in the assessment of cholesteatoma. We'll talk about that here in a couple minutes. Um, and I think it's really an important um, tool for trying to differentiate middle ear masses because you can base um, a lot of your differential diagnosis, you can narrow it down based upon the signal characteristics, the enhancement, et cetera, that you get a much better sense of, obviously, with, with MRI than, than on CT alone. And again, I want to stress, if you don't find a cause, don't sign off on that report. Put it back in your queue. Read a couple more studies, open it back up again, fresh set of eyes, stick to your search pattern. Again, it's a mechanical issue. You should find a cause almost every time, uh, so persist. Keep looking until you find something. So what's my search pattern? I like an outside-in approach. It doesn't matter how you do it. The only thing I would say is do it the same way every single time, because if you find yourself missing something, it's much easier to correct if you do it the same way every time. So I start with the external auditory canal, starting with the cartilaginous EAC out laterally, moving medial to the bony EAC, take a look at the tympanic membrane, then the ossicular chain, those three bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. We've got a couple of important joints, we'll talk about those in a couple minutes, and then the suspensory ligaments that hold that ossicular chain in place, kind of like a marionette. And then lastly, turn your attention to the oval window. We're going to say a few things about the anatomy because I think it's important uh, whenever you're dealing with conductive hearing loss to really have a good understanding of the anatomy. So we'll start with the external auditory canal, and its primary role is for sound conduction. It's kind of like this old-timey ear horn that you see this gentleman using. And it funnels the sound waves down toward the external auditory canal. So out laterally, 
we can see that we've got this fibrocartilage. As we work medially, we're into the uh, tympanic bone itself. And at the deep uh, margin of that tympanic uh, cavity, or of that external auditory canal, the bony external uh, auditory canal, we find our tympanic membrane. So here as we look at this coronal non-contrast CT, uh, we can see that the tympanic membrane really should be almost imperceptible. So you can just barely make it out in its normal, unadulterated state. Uh, up above, it attaches at the scutum. Down below, it's going to attach at the tympanic annulus. And we call that region sort of at the top of it the pars flaccida, the more mobile area. And down at the bottom, we call it the pars tensa, where it holds tight. Uh, you also have your lateral epitympanic recess, or your prusac space, if you like to name things after people. And that's an important area that we look for pars flaccida acquired cholesteatomas. The ossicular chain is made up of three tiny bones. Don't take my word for it, they're tiny, right? You can see all three of them laid out on the standard issue US dime. You have the malleus, the club, the incus, the anvil, and the stapes, the stirrup. And those are held together at a couple of joints. You have your incutomalleal joint and an incutostapedial joint. And those are potential areas that can either be disarticulated with trauma or you may have ankylosis with inflammatory things like tympanosclerosis. And this ossicular chain forms a contiguous chain that goes all the way from the tympanic membrane out lateral to the oval window medially. So as we look on CT, again on the coronal CT images, we can see our, our malleus, our incus, and then our stapes that points its way over toward the oval window. But it, all three of those form a continuous chain. And those connect the tympanic membrane out laterally to the oval window that you can see here denoted with the yellow arrow medially. So we look on our axial uh, CT image, you can see where that uh, oval window is at as well. But again, the role of this ossicular chain is to serve as a transducer. So it converts the acoustic energy of the sound waves into mechanical energy that uh, serves as a piston force at the oval window and then gets translated to the inner ear structures. I mentioned that there's some ossicular uh, ligaments, these suspensory ligaments that hold it in place, kind of like the strings on a marionette. And here on this axial CT image, you can see the posterior incutal ligament. It has a lateral slip and a medial slip. The arrow would be pointing at the lateral slip of it. Uh, this is the anterior malleal ligament on the axial CT image, and again, working from the head of the malleus anteriorly to the tegmen. And then we also have a lateral malleal ligament. You can see denoted here with the yellow arrow, almost imperceptible. And then on the coronal image, we can see the superior malleal ligament connecting it to the tegmen tympani. And again, I want to stress, these should be almost imperceptible. If you see them too well, if they look too dense, if they're too thickened, especially in the setting of chronic otitis, be thinking about one of the diagnoses, that we'll uh, diagnoses we'll talk about later, which is tympanosclerosis. Okay, so we're just going to talk about some differential diagnoses. I'm going to start a kind of, again, from an outside-in approach. So we'll start with external auditory canal and tympanic membrane. Uh, and we'll talk about some common things and some less common things. So first up is cerumen. This is a common incidental finding. Um, usually these impactions of cerumen get rectified long before the patient has a CT for conductive hearing loss, especially if they're seeing a reputable ENT. Um, that being said, we do see these all the time, usually as an incidental finding uh, on, uh, on you know, head CTs done for other reasons. Um, but as simply as soft tissue or debris in the external auditory canal, that EAC is usually incompletely opacified. It doesn't usually form a complete plug, but sometimes it can. Um, but look at the bones. I think the bones tell the story here. We can see normal bones. There's no erosions. Um, and uh, there's no remodeling, there's no expansion. So if it looks like normal bone of the EAC with a soft tissue plug in it, it's probably gonna be cerumen. Next is the pars flaccida acquired cholesteatoma. These are non-neoplastic masses, and I use the term mass generically. Again, these are not tumors, but they do occupy space. And you can think of these as sort of balls of squamous epithelium and shed keratin squames. Um, and these tend to originate at the pars flaccida, oftentimes at a retraction pocket, as you can see on this diagram. Um, and these will progressively enlarge. And when they do, they become locally aggressive. So this may uh, erode or chew up the temporal bone, the external auditory canal, can even get so big that it gets into the otic capsule. And certainly these are associated with ossicular uh, erosions, which will require surgical reconstruction that we'll talk about at the end of this. On CT, this is going to be a non-enhancing soft tissue mass in the lateral epitympanic recess, or Prusac space, if you like to name things after people. 
Um, but the real telltale finding on CT, the one that gives you specificity when you see the soft tissue is erosions. So I am not keen on calling cholesteatoma unless I see erosion. I mean, sometimes it looks very big and globby and it's in the right location, um, but you don't feel good about calling that diagnosis. In fact, I would recommend don't swing for the fence on these just on CT alone. Um, that's where MRI may have a complementary role that we'll talk about, but when you can call it with confidence and when you can be very firm on CT is when you see bone erosions. So like in this case, we have blunting of the scutum. It's been whittled down by this cholesteatoma. Um, these can erode the ossicular chain as well about 70% of the time as they get larger. In this case, you can see this little rat bite out of the ossicular chain. We've got all this soft tissue of pacifying the epitempanum, and look, there are uh, multifocal erosions within the overlying tegmen. It can also erode the facial nerve canal and get into the otic capsule as well. Now, MRI, very complementary in the assessment of cholesteatomas. These are going to be non-enhancing masses when you give contrast. They tend to be uh, iso-intense on T1 and hyper-intense uh, hyper on T2-weighted imaging. When we do give contrast, you may see a very, very thin, fine rind of enhancement at its periphery. That is not the cholesteatoma enhancing, but that's the adjacent granulation tissue. That may be, in fact, one of the things that causes the erosions is that inflammatory granulation response. Uh, but nonetheless, these are non-enhancing masses. The real money uh, on MRI is diffusion-weighted imaging, and in particular, non-echo planar diffusion-weighted imaging, uh, which is really superior to the echo planar prepped uh, sequences. Uh, and that's because um, cholesteatomas are light bulb bright. Uh, in fact, they are so bright, and you can see the lesions so well, that it may even obviate the need for second look surgery uh, for the ENTs to confirm that they did a complete clean out before doing reconstruction. So you can see this light bulb bright cholesteatoma on this haste or non echo planar diffusion weighted imaging. It's just another case of a pars flaccid acquired cholesteatoma. You can see on the uh, coronal non contrast bone CT, the soft tissue a pacification of the lateral epitopanic recess with blunting of the scutum. And so put to use what I just told you about diffusion weighted imaging. Well, unfortunately, this is what a uh, standard issue echo planar diffusion sequence looks like. Is that the cholesteatoma? Is that the cholesteatoma? Is that the cholesteatoma? It's hard to know. Because of the susceptibility artifact of the air bone interface that we get at the temporal bone, echo planar prep is not good for looking at cholesteatomas. Instead, if you've got it, use a non-echo planar technique, a haste diffusion, in this case, right on the axial plane, you can see, yep, that was the cholesteatoma. Doesn't stand out on the EPI uh, diffusion, but it really pops out as light bulb bright on the uh, haste diffusion. So again, very sensitive sequence. I recommend uh, having that as a standard uh, sequence if you can when you're looking at cholesteatomas. Just another case, you can see just how T2 bright this is. That again is not a coronal non-contrast CT. Got it mislabeled here. That's an axial T2 space. Uh, but you can see maybe just the most faint rim of enhancement at the margins, but in general, this thing's not enhancing. This is your money sequence right here, the coronal haste or the non-echo planar diffusion. Uh, you can run resolve diffusion. Looks uh, look, uh, Works pretty well on these as well. Uh, some of the, the uh, recent small field of view diffusion sequences that have come online over the last few years are, are pretty promising as well. But again, that thin rind of enhancing granulation tissue may be seen, may not be seen, but that's the only part that'll show enhancement. The cholesteatoma itself is not enhancing. About that. Next, EAC squamous cell carcinoma. These are going to be the most common external auditory canal masses. It's more common actually to be secondary where it starts in the external ear and erodes its way down than to have one that originates in the EAC itself. Uh, on CT, these are heterogeneously enhancing masses. When they get big, they certainly can erode bone, like in this case here, eroding out the EAC. Um, be on the lookout for parotid nodal metastases. Parotid is your first order nodal drainage of your skin, of your scalp, your face, uh, and your external ear. So be on the lookout. This is one that showed up, no joke, five o'clock from the ER, lump on face, you know, giant tumor with a parotid nodal metastasis. Uh, on MRI, these are going to be enhancing masses. Um, they may have perineural tumor spread, so be on the lookout for that. Next is a broad category, the congenital external and middle ear malformations. Um, I hate talking about embryology because I'm woefully underprepared to talk about it. I think most people uh, feel the same way. Um, but it, it does play a role, and it's worth understanding that um, there is a similar embryologic origin for the EAC in the middle ear. So the external auditory canal comes to the first branchial groove. Um, the 
uh, ossicular chain arises from the first and second branchial arches. These are structures that are, that are sort of developing uh, at the same time and, and in synchrony with one another. The inner ear, though, forms separately. It's, it's derived separately. It forms separately. Um, so those tend not to have mutations, uh, uh, ab abnormalities at the same time. They can in some syndromes. Uh, don't get me wrong, but um, you oftentimes will see a normal inner ear in patients that have congenital external and middle or ear malformations. Um, there are syndromic and genetic causes. I think the, the three that we see most commonly are hemifacial microsomia, brachioadrenal syndrome, and treacher collinge, but there are many, many more. And it's a spectrum disorder. So the external auditory canal, I'm uh, sorry, let's start with the external ear. It can be completely absent with anosia, uh, or it can be small with a microtic ear. Uh, the EAC may be stenotic, or it may be completely atretic. The tympanic membrane, it can be thickened, can even be calcified or ossified. These patients tend to have small middle ear cavities. The ossicular chain is oftentimes abnormal. And you can have a rudimentary ossicular chain. You can have sort of an, a conglomerate abnormal ossicular fusion mass. Uh, you can have malrotation, malformation uh, of the ossicular elements as well. Be on the lookout for associated oval window atresia, and any time you see that, you need to be looking at the course of the facial nerve and making sure they don't have an aberrant course. We'll spend some time speaking just about that toward the end of this talk. This was a patient with brachioodorenal syndrome. You can see they've got an EAC membranous stenosis on the image on the left, and the axial uh, image on the right, you can see this abnormal sort of rudimentary ossicular fusion mass as well. So again, EAC and middle ear malformations kind of go hand in hand. This patient also had a small middle ear cavity. Another patient, this one, uh, strangely enough, imaged the same day, both showed up within two patients of each other to get imaged. Um, and um, you can see the images on the left on this coronal CT image, we have this membranous EAC atresia, kind of a small middle ear cavity. And again, this abnormal ossicular fusion mass with a small middle ear in a patient who had hemifacial microsomia. Next is EAC cholesteatoma. These can be either congenital or acquired. The acquired are more common. Both of them are pretty uh, rare entities, um, but these are erosive lesions made up of exfoliated keratin. So again, this sort of mass of desquamated keratin and, and skin uh, where it's not supposed to be. Um, on CT, these tend to be unilateral, although I'll show you a bilateral case in a moment. Um, but you see scalloping and erosion of the external auditory canal with that soft tissue mass. Look for these little tiny flecks of bone that get left behind. You'll see those not uncommonly. Uh, on MRI, these uh, will have uh, uh, reduced diffusivity like other cholesteatomas. So this patient had bilateral EAC cholesteatomas, which my understanding is that's pretty rare, but you can see the scalloped out, eroded appearance of the bony EAC along the floor bilaterally with soft tissue component and little teeny tiny flecks of bone that you can appreciate best on the image on the right. Next is the EAC osteoma. This is just a rare benign uh, pedunculated bone overgrowth that pooches into the EAC. This sits under the skin and mucosa, so this is covered by the normal overlying soft tissues. It kind of has that marble under the rug appearance. On CT, these tend to be de uh, very defined and benign appearing excrescences uh, protruding into the uh, EAC. Um, but be on the lookout, as this image nicely shows you, you can get trap debris and cerumen and sometimes even secondary cholesteatomas forming. Um, and these patients also are, are at an in increased risk of developing otitis externa. Something that's sometimes confused for this is an EAC exostosis. So these are benign osseous overgrowth into the EAC, but these tend to be broad-based or cir uh, circumferential. Um, and these are associated with chronic cold water exposure, not always, but there's a high association. So this has the moniker of a surfer ear, but certainly we see it in kayakers and cold water swimmers and that sort of thing. Um, these exostoses and their associated conductive hearing loss uh, are typically bilateral, but usually one side is worse than the other. So a recent case uh, that we had, you can see that uh, there's bilateral circumferential bony uh, excrescence into the external auditory canal. It's narrowing the EAC aperture, but instead of this being a focal pedunculated lesion, this is circumferential and one side is worse than the other. This is a very typical appearance of EAC exostoses. Next is keratosis obturans. This is a truly a rare entity. Um, and this is something that, it's a little bit bizarre, but it's, it's caused by um, 
by this formation of a desquamated keratin plug that occludes the external auditory canal. Um, and when they're small, they don't do any bony remodeling, but as they get bigger and bigger over time, they can slowly remodel and widen out the bony EAC, but it doesn't really erode it per se. Um, and this has a very characteristic clinical scenario in which patients will have oftentimes acute but very severe otalgia. Uh, and that ear pain can be quite excruciating as they're trying to debride and remove that plug. Um, so that's uh, an important clinical feature that can help you feel good about that diagnosis. Even though it sounds kind of like a cholesteatoma, it's not. These are not the same thing, so don't confuse these with cholesteatomas. You can see here there's no erosion, just a little bit of benign osseous widening. Something else that can look a bit like that is medial canal fibrosis. Um, and these patients develop a thick fibrous tissue plug along the deep and medial portion of their external auditory canal. And this is really thought to be the end game of multiple possible pathways, uh, whether it be chronic otitis externa, separative ot uh, otitis media, or even iatrogenic things like surgery or, or prior radiation or even trauma. Um, but be on the lookout for this appearance where they have a crescentic soft tissue plug that's really uh, inseparable from the tympanic membrane. You can see here at the yellow arrow. Um, and these tend to spare the middle ear. This is an interesting case that we had relatively recently in which a patient um, had conductive hearing loss and the ENTs looked in, in the ears and it just looked like skin. And so they imaged them and sure enough, they have these crescentic soft tissue plugs down deep in the EAC, a very classic appearance of medial canal fibrosis. All right, we're gonna move on to the middle ear and osteocular change diagnoses. Um, and you can see there's some common things and some uncommon diagnoses that we'll talk about. And first up is chronic otitis media. Now this is a clinical diagnosis, don't get me wrong, but there are some potential imaging correlates. Um, on otoscopy, these patients may have thickened reddish uh, tympanic membranes. Oftentimes it's associated with perforations. On CT, look for fluid or debris in the middle ear. Oftentimes it has a bit of a linear appearance. And one thing that I think can be a real helpful feature is take a 20,000 foot view and look for this under pneumatized and sclerotic mastoid. And that tells you this is a longstanding process. Now a potential and important complication of chronic otitis and otomastoiditis is tympanosclerosis. And this is a post-inflammatory ossicular fixation that can be associated with otitis media or otomastoiditis. And um, you know, you can, if you wanna be a splitter, you can and lump, break it up into multiple subtypes. I tend to be a lumper and I just look at it all as tympanosclerosis. But basically what's going on here is you've got um, the middle ear structures that will become calcified or hyalinized. And that includes the ossicles, uh, the suspensory ligaments, and the sound densening muscles, the tensor tympani uh, and the sp uh, stapedius. Um, and what is the hallmark appearance? It's that these structures look too dense and too thickened on CT. Um, we see the, temp the uh, suspensory ligaments too well. Sometimes you even get fluffy uh, calcification on the ossicular chain. Uh, kind of looks like sprinkles on the ice cream cone, as Rick Wiggins likes to say. Um, so here's just a couple of different looks for tympanosclerosis. Image on the left, you can see uh, this axial CT image. The anterior malleal ligament is just way, way too dense in a patient who had chronic otomastoiditis. Um, this patient on the right, different patient, you can see just this fluffy amorphous calcification along the ossicular chain. You can also have some secondary clues here. It's an under, under pneumatized sclerotic otomastoid, and there's fluid or debris within the middle ear. Now, something that can look a bit similar is congenital ossicular fixation. Uh, and this can either be a fibrous uh, uh, bond or it can even be a rigid bar like in this case here. And as you can see, that looks a bit like the tympanosclerosis, right? Um, and uh, when you see this, also be on the lookout for malformed ossicles because sometimes you see this with the congenital uh, external and middle ear malformations. Um, these may be uh, found in isolation. These can be uh, seen in multiple syndromes like brachioid or renal syndrome. Um, and some of the frequent ankylosis points that you look for would be here along the tegmen. That's the one I see most commonly. Uh, you can also see the chain fused to the acicular or to the uh, cochlear uh, promontory, or along the course of the facial nerve canal. So here's that same patient that had um, that had the medial canal fibrosis, and you can see that the stapy superstructure has a non-osseous fixation point to the facial nerve canal, which is interestingly a little bit on the medialized course. Um, and then you can also have uh, fusion at the, at the stapes foot plate. This is uh, CT occult uh, most of the time. But keep in mind with these, these are congenital. 
and you have to have the right history. These patients can't have had prior bouts of otomastoiditis or, or uh, otitis media. Um, so that's an important clinical uh, thing to, to be aware of. Something we do see with great frequency is temporal bone trauma. Um, and patients that have temporal bone fractures can have conductive hearing loss if the fracture involves the external auditory canal, or if it disrupts the osteocular chain, or if there's a bunch of blood within the middle ear. Um, and traditionally, we describe these as either being longitudinal, if it's along the long axis of the temporal bone, or transverse, if the fracture goes along the short axis, or sometimes like this case, uh, it's sort of both, it's a mixed uh, pattern. One of the things that's important to report is whether or not it's otic capsule involving or otic capsule sparing, not necessarily for conductive hearing loss purposes, but otic capsule involving fractures are much, much higher to be highly, um, have a much higher association uh, with sensory neural hearing loss. So here's a case, temporal bone fracture. You can see it extending sort of medially toward the osicular chain. Look very carefully, you can see that that short process of the incus has a lucency running through it with a fracture. And, it, and an important secondary finding, the head of the malleus has slipped away from the short process of the incus, so they also have a traumatic disarticulation. So that's my segue into talking about osicular chain dislocations. Uh, I think these are overlooked complications of trauma. We always are looking for the fractures, but also you need to look at that osicular chain alignment. Uh, most common is going to be the incutostipedial followed by incutomalleal. Um, and these can be subtle. You need to use the multiplanar reformats. These are very helpful here. So an axial CT, you look for the ice cream falling off the ice cream cone. So here that uh, the head of the malleus, the ice cream, looks like it's just starting to gap away from the incus, like ice cream falling off the ice cream cone or you look on the coronal at the broken heart sign. So this is the broken heart sign of Rick Wiggins. Um, and as you can see here, we've got a couple bones, the malleus and the incus, and that gap is too wide. That should be close together. It should look like a normal heart. This looks like a broken heart. So always use those NPRs. I think this is a much easier plane to see it in than on the axials. Our next broad topic are middle ear masses. And so any mass centered within the middle ear can interfere with the ossicular chain. Uh, and this is another place where I think MRI is helpful because you can look at the signal characteristics and you can also look at the bone changes on CT to try to narrow down your differential. So the first topic is a glomus tympanicum paraganglioma. These are typically benign, not always, but most of the time, benign tumors of chemoreceptor cells. These arise from, uh, from those receptor cells along the cochlear promontory. They can be locally aggressive, particularly as they get larger. On autoscopy, these patients will have red retrotympanic masses. And on imaging, you want to look for a permeative destructive lesion on CT, a permeative destructive mass as it gets bigger. When it's small, it'll just be a small mass along the cochlear promontory. Uh, but if you give contrast, particularly on MRI, these are avidly enhancing. Uh, so we've got two images here. The image on the left uh, is axial, the image on the right is coronal. You can see sort of this rounded mass along the cochlear promontory. You can imagine how that may bump up against the ossicular chain. That's a very classic appearance of a glomus tympanicum paraganglioma. If you give contrast, it'll enhance avidly. Now, as these get larger, they can fill the entirety of the middle ear cavity. You can see the coronal uh, bone CT on the left and the coronal T1 post-contrast fat saturated image on the right. And you can see how it's totally encasing the ossicular chain. In fact, we see it as a little dark filling defect within the middle ear cavity on the MRI image as well. So when they get big, they can be a challenge to differentiate from things like middle ear adenomas, which we'll talk about in a minute. So these are not to be confused with glomus jugulari paragangliomas. These are paragangliomas that arise from the glomus bodies in or around the jugular foramen. Uh, and these have a hallmark, very characteristic, superolateral vector of spread. So they start in the jugular foramen, but then they grow out in a superolateral manner uh, through the floor of the middle ear uh, and into the middle ear cavity itself. Um, on autoscopy, these also show up as red retrotympanic masses. On imaging, again, you're looking for those permeative destructive bone changes on CT and that classic salt and pepper appearance on MRI. So two images here, coronal non-contrast bone CT on the left and a T1 post-contrast fat saturated coronal image on the right. And you can see the permeative destructive bone changes, the avidly enhancing mass, and that very characteristic supralateral vector of spread. So here's what I mean about using the bone changes and the signal characteristics. So we have a mass, it's centered at the jugular foramen, Look at those permeative destructive bone changes on CT. To me, that's pathognomonic essentially for this being a glomus jugulari paraganglioma. But to be certain, get an MRI. We can see it's got areas of intrinsic bright T1 signal intensity. This is a T1 precontrast. That's what we call our so-called salt due to blood products. 
And on the T2 weighted image, we see these little squiggly uh, dark things, largely out the periphery, the high velocity flow voids that make up the so-called T2 dark pepper. So use the bone CT changes and use the MRI signal uh, characteristics to diagnose with great certainty that this is a paraganglioma. And I put this slide in here just to remind you that what the ENTs see through their otoscope is really just the tip of the iceberg. So these are red retro tympanic masses, whether it's a glomus tympanicum or a glomus jugulari. Um, and so uh, it's your job, it's really incumbent upon you as the radiologist to define which one it is because it's a much different and much more aggressive surgery if they have to do a full skull-based surgery to clean out a glomus jugulari compared to what may be just a middle ear tumor with a glomus tympanicum. So it's a really critical distinction that you need to make. Next is the middle ear schwannoma. Uh, these uh, are schwannomas that arise in the intratemporal facial nerve. Usually these span multiple segments. Um, and this is simply an uncommon location of a very common tumor. Uh, these patients, about 70% will present with hearing loss and about half of them will have some variety of a cranial nerve 7 paresis. Um, but these are avidly enhancing tubular masses. And because that tympanic segment facial nerve canal is so thin, these oftentimes will pedunculate out into the middle ear cavity. So here's what I mean by that pedunculation on the non-contrast bone CT. Uh, you can see uh, this sort of low density mass, but it's protruding from the facial nerve canal out into the middle ear cavity, uh, butting right up against the ossicular chain. You can imagine how that might contribute to conductive hearing loss. You can see that protruding component of it on the avidly enhancing T1 post-contrast uh, sequence here. And again, have that sort of bilobe protruding component that you can see nicely on the coronal T1 post-contrast fat saturated image. So again, look for that pedunculated mass, but it really, part of it has to go along that cranial nerve seven. You need to see that cranial nerve seven involvement to be certain that you're dealing with a cranial nerve seven schwannoma. I mentioned before that middle ear adenomas can be challenging. Well, these are rare, but fortunately benign tumors. Um, these have a mixed exocrine and neuroendocrine origin. Um, unfortunately, the imaging is really nonspecific. Uh, so these avidly enhance, as you can see here, um, like a paraganglioma. Uh, they may have a bit of a lobular appearance, especially when they're small, so you may mistake it for a schwannoma. Next topic is the pars tensa acquired cholesteatoma. These are much, much less common than pars flaccida cholesteatomas. Um, there's different thoughts, different schools of thought on exactly how these form, but it's thought that a tympanic membrane perforation is sort of a catalyst. Um, but these present on CT with the appearance of an erosive mass that's uh, really down lower than the pars flaccida. These are involving the pars tensa. Um, and these involve the posterior mesotympanum, oftentimes medial to the ossicles and involving the ossicular chain. Um, on MRI, these are not enhancing. Look for that reduced diffusivity. You can also get congenital middle ear cholesteatomas. Um, this is a cholesteatoma that forms behind an intact tympanic membrane, typically medial to, but oftentimes involving the ossicles. And you really have to have that setting of no prior trauma, no surgery, no prior otitis. Uh, these are just ones they're born with. Um, this is associated with EAC atresia, so be on the lookout on those uh, patients that have EAC atresias. Uh, and these, because they form along the ossicular chain, are prone to eroding the ossicular chain. Uh, the common uh, hit points are the long process of the incus uh, and the stapes superstructure, as you can see in this image here. Uh, this was just a, a case, a nice case of a middle ear uh, congenital cholesteatoma from our institution. You can see this uh, sort of lobular mass filling the middle ear, um, maybe just starting to erode the ossicular chain a little bit. Uh, you can see on the axial image with that. Next diagnosis is the middle ear cholesterol granuloma. Um, these are interesting lesions. They're caused by recurrent hemorrhage into the middle ear. There's some, some different theories about why that happens that I won't get into for this talk. Um, but uh, these result in an inflammatory mass of granulation tissue. On otoscopy, these patients will have a bluish tint to their uh, tympanic membrane. And uh, on CT, uh, look for an opacified, expansile appearance to the middle ear cavity, especially when they get big. These get big and expansile. When they're small, it's a challenge. But uh, as they get larger, they certainly have an expansile look. And characteristically, these will be very bright on T1-weighted imaging due to the presence of um, a met hemoglobin within, within them, as well as maybe to a, a much lesser extent, uh, the presence of some cholesterol crystals. So here's what they look like. This is one uh, on axial T2 weighted image, uh, sort of an opacified middle ear with some T2 brightish material. Uh, do the T1 pre-contrast image. Wow, that's light bulb bright. And you're saying, well, is this fat? Is this an autologous fat graft or some, some weird thing like that? 
Give contrast, fat saturated, well, it's still really, really bright. Didn't get much brighter, so it's probably not really enhancing, um, but it doesn't fat, uh, sat out, so it's not fat. So that intrinsic T1 bright appearance, uh, usually these are heterogeneously T2 bright as well. Look for that expansile change on, on uh, bone CT. Um, and again, these are not fatty lesions. These are intrinsically T1 bright. Just a couple things to talk about at the oval window. Uh, the first of these will be finasteral otosclerosis, uh, and the second will be oval window HD. So first up, we have finasteral otosclerosis or otospongiosis, and these patients will have a progressive conductive or mixed hearing loss. This is really of, un, of unknown etiology, um, but importantly, this is a multiphasic disease. So early on, they have these spongiotic uh, changes to the bone due to increased osteoclastic remodeling. This is the otospongiosis phase uh, that starts at the fissile antifenestrum. I'll talk about that on the next slide. But this will progress to late stage disease in which they have this disorganized osteoblastic or healing response, the so-called otosclerotic phase of disease, where they get this heaped up bone, in this case, sort of forming this donut lesion around the oval window at the uh, stapes foot plate, um, and that sort of anneals it or ankyloses it in place, causing conductive hearing loss. So again, this starts anterior to the oval window at this fancy little spot called the fissula antifenestrum. Um, and then over time, in bad cases, it can progress to completely surround the cochlea. We call that cochlear otospongiosis. Um, but we're not going to talk about that for this talk because that's more of a mixed hearing loss thing. Um, but CT, early on with fenestral otospongiosis, you'll have that focal lucency at the fistula antifenestrum, denoted here by the yellow arrow. Um, later on in disease, you'll get this heaped up sclerosis. It may progress to having that pericochlear lucency. Um, if you see that pericochlear lucency, pay close attention because you will have disease going on at the fistula antifenestrum. It just may be uh, in that sclerotic phase rather than the So what does it look like? On axial CT, uh, we can see that lucency localized at the fistula antifenestrum, the image on the left, and the image on the right, you can see we're starting to get a bit of that heaped up appearance of the bone along the anterior portion of the stapes foot plate. Uh, and you can see how that certainly could cause ankylosis and impair that conduction at the, uh, at the oval window. And then the last differential diagnosis to talk about is oval window atresia. I briefly hinted at it at the beginning of the talk, um, but this is uh, a patient who will have congenital and non-progressive conductive hearing loss. Um, and in these cases, the oval window has been replaced by an ossific web or actually a, sometimes a true at atresia bone plate, as you can see in this diagram. Um, importantly, critically, this is something that's associated with an inframedial position of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. So in 100% of these cases, you need to find the facial nerve and you need to report its course. Um, they can also be associated with a malformed stapes, not such a big deal because they're going to uh, do an ossicular reconstruction. But you have to let the surgeons know where the facial nerve is because it has a, uh, a tendency to sit inframedially and overlap uh, that atresia plate. So when they go to repair that atresia plate, they need to know that the, uh, whether or not the facial nerve is sitting right there because what you don't wanna have happen is a patient who goes into surgery unable to hear because of conductive hearing loss, they wake up able to hear, but they no longer have function in that side of their face because of a new uh, cranial nerve seven injury. So it is absolutely critical that you find this and you report it. To me, this is a phone call if you find it. Um, and so here in this case, you can see just a patient had a complex congenital external middle ear malformation. You can see uh, that they have uh, sort of a, a membranous atresia of the EAC, but where the yellow arrow is pointing is the inframedial position of the facial nerve canal. Um, this one's a little bit challenging in the sense that the patient didn't have the, the characteristic uh, uh, appearance uh, because they are missing their lateral semicircular canal, part of their middle ear atresia, uh, but nonetheless, um, you can see that it's got this inframedial positioning and that overlies this atresia plate. So this is a critical finding. You have to let the surgeons know ahead of time about this. And that's going to be my segue into a very brief wrap up here. We're just going to briefly touch upon some osseculoplasties. So osseculoplasty is a surgical reconstruction of the ossicular chain. Um, it can be done through allograft, which is synthetic materials or metallic substances, or they can do uh, uh, autograft as well using the patient's own native os ossicles in which they reshape and, and reposition them. And, and there's really just a couple types. Um, broad categories, we think of our ossicular replacement prostheses, our ORPs, of which you can have two. You can have a total ossicular replacement prosthesis or a TORP, 
or you can have a partial ossicular replacement prosthesis, a PORP. You can also have stapes prosthesis. That's sort of a subtype again, yet of PORP. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then you can have the Inca center position graft, which is an auto graft in which they sort of slice and dice and reposition the native bones. Okay, so total ossicular replacement prosthesis, often done in the setting of advanced chronic odo, uh, otomastoiditis or clusteotoma. Um, and the TORP is a replacement of the entire ossicular chain. So in this diagram, we can see that it's connecting the tympanic membrane. They oftentimes put a little patch uh, of cartilage uh, along it, but it's a straight shot over to the oval window. And you can see, as this uh, bone CT shows, it should point straight over to the oval window. Yes, the TM is thickened. That's how they look. They do a uh, tympanoplasty with this, put the patch in as well, um, uh, but it should point straight over to it over to the, uh, to the uh, oval window. Next is a partial ossicular replacement prosthesis, prosthesis uh, done in the similar setting uh, of advanced chronic otitis media or clusteotoma. Uh, but in this case, only part of the ossicular chain is replaced. Um, and you can see in this diagram how we've put in this sort of new uh, allograft strut, but it connects to the uh, SAPE superstructure. So they don't have to replace that at the oval window. Um, and here on imaging, um, and these are tough to get all in one plane, oftentimes because they have a little curvature to them, but you can see it's butting up against the reconstructed tympanic membrane. Um, but if you look at the medial side of things, you can see that stapy stupor structure is still there at the oval window. And again, this may be a straight shot over. It may have a little bit of curvature depending on how they have to do it. Um, but you just want to scroll through your stack and make sure that it's all continuous. Uh, next is the stapes prosthesis. This is done uh, really in patients who have otosclerosis, uh, in which they need to sort of free up that oval window, free up that uh, stapes footplate. Uh, so they connect a stapes allograft uh, from the long process of, process of the incus over to the stapes footplate of the oval window. As you can see here, that's all been replaced, but the rest of the ossicular chain is intact. Uh, done again, mainly for otosclerosis that is disease-centric to the oval window region. Here's what it looks like. You can see we just have the allograft that goes all the way over to the oval window. Um, we can see there's still some native ossicular chain up in the uh, epitympanum here. Um, if you were to scroll back a slice or two, you would see how this connects over to the remnant ossicular chain. Again, real tough to get these all in one slice and be able to show the anatomy well. Um, importantly, the oval window insertion doesn't need to be exactly smack dab central to it. If it's approximating, it's probably good enough to get sound conducting. Uh, so I just report it, you know, it's, it approximates the oval window. And then last, we have our incus interposition graft, uh, often done in the setting of chronic otitis media, uh, where the bones haven't been thoroughly chewed up like they would with a clusteotoma. But this is complex. We don't actually see a lot of these getting done at, at my site anyway. Uh, we see a lot more, allogra uh, a lot more allografts being put in. Um, but in this case, what they do is they rotate the incus down. They sort of re-sculpt and connect the malleus with the stapes capitulum here. So you can see they've sort of swung it around and they've, they've reshaped it, and now it's butting up against the, the capitulum of the stapes. Um, again, typically these are going to be autographed, um, especially after the, the HIV uh, epidemic in the 80s and 90s. Um, they really stopped using uh, donor bone for this for the most part. Um, but here uh, is an example of one. It just looks abnormal, right? We've got sort of this incus -y looking thing that's now butting up against the TM, projecting over toward the oval window. Um, but that's what this one was. This is an incus interposition graft. It's just important not to confuse it for, for uh, missing or, or traumatized or dislocated uh, ossicular chain. This one was a bit challenging because lo and behold, they also had a big cephalocele. Okay, so those were the different devices and surgeries. Um, your job is to really look for complications. So you want to look for dislocation or subluxation. Here's a coronal CT image. We've got this porp that's fallen down into the hypotympanum. That's not helping anybody, right? So it's not pushing uh, uh, anywhere near uh, pushing on the, on the oval window or the tympanic membrane. Um, we also need to report whether there's soft tissue against it. And that's a real diagnostic dilemma because we don't know if that's recurrent disease like clusteotoma unless we have a hallmark erosions that may just be scar or granulation tissue or just even fluid or debris within the middle ear. So it's just something you have to be descriptive of and, and let them try to figure it out uh, through otoscopy if they can. Uh, sometimes they push it in a little bit too far. So this one's protruding uh, through the oval window and into the vestibule. Um, and it can protrude so far that it can rupture things and cause pneuma labyrinth, and that can be associated with uh, some complications that they try to avoid. So be on the lookout. Make sure you've got your studies windowed appropriately. I usually do sort of a 
450 uh, and 4,000 windowing and leveling uh, because you can sort of see what is fluid, what is bone, what is air, uh, and be able to pick up subtle Nuba labyrinth. So that kind of wraps things up. Again, thanks for joining into this sort of this inaugural off the cuff talk. Um, but uh, again, wrapping things up here, conductive hearing loss is very common. There's a lot of etiologies. Hopefully you get a, a flavor of that with this presentation. CT again is our primary tool for imaging conductive hearing loss, uh, but MRI does play an important role. It's complementary, especially in the setting of cholesteatoma, as well as differentiating these middle ear masses. I wanna to stress to you that conductive hearing loss is a mechanical problem, uh, so stick to that search pattern. Uh, you really should find a cause almost every single time. So if you don't find a cause at first, don't sign your report, put it back in your queue, read a few studies, come back to it with a fresh set of eyes, stick with that search pattern, don't let it fail you, you should find a cause virtually every single time. And with that, I appreciate your attention. Thanks for tuning in. You can always follow along on uh, Twitter at NA Kuntz uh, and join us for our case of the day stuff. All right, take care.